Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Andy Cahan. I am director of author events. When I was pitched Steve Luxenberg's latest book, I was both chagrined and intrigued to learn that a Philadelphia-based incident was one of the cases that set a precedent for Plessy versus Ferguson. Chagrined because a black teacher named Mary Miles was thrown off the Westchester railway line, intrigued because she was a gritty Philadelphian with the temerity to stand up to authority. Tonight, you can expect to hear the rest of this fascinating story. I'll also tell you that it's the first time I ever got an author pitch from a publisher that made me teary-eyed. Um, and I just found out that was this guy's doing. He'll be here momentarily. Our guest, Steve Luxemburg, has overseen reportage that has won a number of awards, including two Pulitzer Prizes for explanatory journalism for the Washington Post, where he was a senior editor for 30 years. He is also the author of Annie's Ghosts, A Journey in a Family Secret, which tells the tale of his eponymous aunt who was locked away in a mental institution and seemingly erased from his mother's memory. Luxembourg's new book, Separate, Plessy versus Ferguson and America's Journey from Slavery to Segregation is the winner of the J. Anthony Lucas Award and was recently described in the New York Times as an absorbing work written with energy, elegance, and a heart aching for a world without segregation. Please welcome Steve Luxembourg. Well, that New York Times review is so recent that it hasn't been, actually been published in print yet, but it will be this Sunday, so look for it. Um, so I understand that uh, Pete Buttigieg was here the other uh, couple days ago, and he had 400 people, and it was so packed you couldn't get in. I just want to announce I'm not running for president, <laughs> which may explain why I don't have as big a crowd. Uh, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to talk about 25 minutes. I'm going to talk about the general story. I'm going to talk about the Philadelphia part of the story. Then we're going to take questions. There'll be people in the aisles. I'm sure some of you have been here before. The, the audience has salted with ringers that I brought in. <laughs> See, they're laughing. That's, I told them to do that. <laughs> My wife is here, and she plays a very important role in the, in, the, uh, in the creation of this book because when I was struggling to cut some pages, some many pages, out of this doorstop. She came in one day and said, I just listened to NPR and they tell me that big history is back. <laughs> <laughs> so also in my family for the last, oh, six years, we often have conversations about politics and I would find a place to interject well, in the 19th century, and after a while, I never even got to that point, they would just hold up their hand and say, enough about the 19th century. But that's why this is a big night for me, because you guys can't interrupt me. I'm talking about the 19th century now. So let's talk about the 19th century a little bit. Um, one of the problems with our 21st century eyes is we cannot imagine what it was like to live in the 19th century. The 14th Amendment. Who here can describe the 14th Amendment? Okay, I'm gonna help you out. Just a phrase. Just any phrase. Due process. Equal protection under the laws, right? Citizenship rights for people of color. Well, the Supreme Court did not embrace the 14th Amendment as it is interpreted today. So when you hear about this case and the cases of the many resistors to separation, you notice I did not say segregation, to separation in the 19th century because they never called it segregation in the 19th century. If you look in newspaper accounts of the time, if you look in letters and diaries, separate and separation was their words. You would not read about an expansive view of the 14th Amendment that we have today. The Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department, which is partly responsible for making sure of the equal protection under the laws and due process for all Americans, but particularly people of color, was not created until 1949. So in, eight, in the 1890s, when the Plessy case comes along, we're gonna talk about what it was like 
the view of the court of the 14th Amendment. So you have to, that's one thing you have to, to remember. The other thing is that there was no Instagram. Shocking to know. I, there, there were no cars, so when you hear about the separate car act, I'm talking about a railroad car, not a motor car, there were no reporters standing breathlessly outside the Supreme Court ready to transmit by Twitter all of the decisions of the day. It was a very different time. And yet, and yet, when we talk about the civil rights movements, the civil rights movement of the what? When I say civil rights movement, we all say 1950s, 1960s. We see those indelible images ranging from some, some of the more terrible ones like Bull Connor to the others that are sit-ins and protests. We don't think of the civil rights movements of the, 19, of the 1860s, of the 1870s, when three civil rights acts were passed. After the Civil War, there were three amendments passed, the 13th, 14th, and 15th to the Constitution, and they are a revolution. The original Constitution, as you know, had three-fifths of a person embedded in it. That was where slavery existed. It was about political apportionment because the South wanted to have their enslaved population counted totally so they could have a lot of political power. The North said, well, yeah, right. We're going to give you all those enslaved people to vote. They can't vote. How, how do you expect us to accept that? So they settled on the three-fifths compromise, and there started the national conversation on race that we still have today. I, I see, one of the reasons why I was drawn to this book is I, I see race as our national conversation. We're either talking about it or we're avoiding talking about it. And racial progress in America has never been made swiftly or easily, and you're going to see that as I tell you about the parallel narratives of, of this book. So the way the book is structured, they are the people who decide the Plessy case. Those are the people, the justices, the lawyers, they're all white. But they're acting on the lawsuits and other protests of people who, of color who are consistently and persistently in the face of violence and intimidation resisting separation. It begins amazingly enough, not in the South, but on a Massachusetts railroad train in 1838. When the Eastern Railroad opens for business, going from Boston to Salem, Massachusetts, and it decides that it's going to have separate cars from its first day of operation. Now, there were eight railroads that were operating, eight passenger railroads operating at the dawn of the railroad age, and only three of them, eight in Massachusetts, only three of them decide to have separate cars. So it's not like it's a universal feeling that the white customers want to have separate cars. And I say white customers because nobody was asking the people of color what they wanted. So when the, when the railroad opens for operation, within a month there's an article in the Salem Gazette about two drunken white sailors who are acting so disgustingly that they offend the passengers and they are banished from the white car to what the newspaper describes as the refuse car, the trash car, the garbage car, the dirt car, or in black and white in the Salem Gazette of October 12, 18, uh, 1838, the Jim Crow car. Now, how many of you would have said that Jim Crow was a phrase used before 1890? You would have said it was used in 1838. You knew that. I'm glad you should have written this book. I could have used you as a researcher. I didn't know that. And when it came up in my digital digging, I was surprised. So I tried to figure out, well, why? Why would the phrase Jim Crow suddenly apply to public transportation so quickly? The railroad had been open one month. And the best educated researched guess that I can give you is, is that the Jim Crow minstrel show was so popular in New England in the 1830s that it had begun to leach into the newspapers in all kinds of ways. The, the, the famous song that Thomas Dartmouth Rice, the most popular of the Jim Crow minstrels, would sing is, every time I jump Jim Crow, which became a synonym for what we today call flip-flopping, politicians who couldn't stay on one side of the issue or the other. 
So they would jump Jim Crow. So I think that's how it became applied to a, a railroad car because it was a kind of convenient phrase. Everybody knows what a Jim Crow is. It was so popular that there were figurines that you could buy at Massachusetts fairs. In, uh, Rice went to uh, Europe on a tour and after his tour was so wildly successful, there was a, a stakes race of a horse, horses in uh, Ireland. And one of them was won, run, won by the Jim Crow horse. That was the name of the horse. So it was a very popular phrase. At the same time, who was on these railroad cars? Well, the population of Massachusetts at the time, people of color f comprised 1% of the population. They were hardly rushing onto the railroad trains. They didn't have much money, for example, but they are different than the population of the South because one, they are free, and in the South, where the system of slavery exists, there's no thought of having a separate railroad car with, what, 30, 40 people of, of color who are enslaved. That seems like a kind of dangerous thing to do. But in the North, what I write in the book is the free and conflicted North, the question of where do I sit, where do I sit, is a very live one at the dawn of the railroad age. There's nothing like a railroad car to throw together a mass of humanity. It doesn't happen on a stagecoach, it certainly doesn't happen on horseback, and on these trains are the most radical politicians of the age, the abolitionists. And they're riding the trains because they've been going to their night meetings on horseback for quite a long time and all the chapters around Boston. And they're thrilled that they can ride in the smoky, foul, diesel, I mean, uh, steam smell of a, of a railroad train rather than being in the dreary night, night of, a, of a bad uh, Massachusetts weather. So they go in pairs of sometimes white and black and they have confrontations with the conductor. And one of those black abolitionists is a 24-year-old guy from Maryland who recently escaped his enslaved conditions, and his name is Frederick Douglass. And he is so determined to fight separation that he writes later in his memoir, he grips his seat, and six men are trying to oust him, and he rips the seat off of its bolts. Probably a little bit of an embellishment, or maybe they didn't bolt it down very well. <laughs> but that's what Douglass says. Meanwhile, there's a visiting abolitionist who's also black. He's not built like Douglas. He's not powerfully built. He doesn't have broad shoulders. He's very slightly built, and he has the problem at the age of 33 of cataracts, and he's nearly blind. And his name is David Ruggles, and when he's thrown off the line going south from Boston, the New Bedford and Taunton line, he's a bruised, his clothing is torn, and he does something that Douglas does not do he brings assault charges against the conductor in the New Bedford Police Court. That is the beginning of the resistance. I mean, there may have been other forms of resistance, but that's the line that I draw between the birth of separation in the North and the Plessy case, which comes out of New Orleans in the South 60 years later in 1896. So if you look at the Plessy case and you read the precedents, now I'm not a legal historian, I'm not a constitutional scholar, I have no business writing this book, <laughs> but I'm a storyteller and in telling the story I was fascinated by the precedents that the majority, the seven to one majority in Plessy in 1896, I was fascinated by what they cited and I, as a device in the book I, I go back over each one of these precedents and I, I selected a sample of them to bring them into the narrative from the beginning. That narrative is, is full of interesting stories, and one of them is the story of Mary Miles that Andy talked about in his introduction. So what's also interesting to me is that the seven justices who decided this case, one justice did not vote in case you think I don't know how to add, and there are six of them are from northern families. Six of them are from northern families, think about that. And the only dissenter in the case, John Marshall Harlan of Kentucky, is the son of a slaveholding family who runs for Congress in 1859 as a pro-slavery candidate. But he evolves over the course of his lifetime into the most uh, 
fierce advocate on the court for civil rights. His opposite is the guy who writes the decision. His name is Henry Billings Brown. And he is born in Massachusetts, in western Massachusetts. He grows up in Connecticut. And he moves to Michigan as a young man in 1859, the same year that Harlan is running for Congress, at about the same age, to become a lawyer. He evolves to the point where he's going to write this majority decision that says that Louisiana can enact such a statute to require equal but separate accommodations on railroad cars for their white and colored passengers. That's a quote from the preamble of the law. You notice I said equal but separate, not separate but equal. So part of the book's story is how did it become separate but equal, which is what we think of it synonymously today. But in that day, they were, they were accepting that it was going to be separate, and they were saying, but you have to have equality. So the way they phrased it was equal, but sure, separate. Brown is on the court for about six years when the Plessy case comes along. Harlan has been on it since 1877. He's much more senior. And he has been the only dissenter, or sometimes paired with one other just, justice, in all of the civil rights cases, there aren't that many, three or four, that the court has looked at between the end of the Civil War, at, well, Harlan didn't get on until 1877, but in the 1883 civil rights cases, in the 1890 Mississippi Separate Car Act case, and in the Louisiana case, he is the dissenter. So let's talk about Mary Miles and the Northern cases. So in Massachusetts, the abolitionists took that those confrontations, and they made an issue out of it, just like all good political activists. And by 1843, after a failed attempt to get the Massachusetts legislature to enact a ban on separate cars, they wanted them banned by law, this company policy, the railroads had voluntarily abandoned the practice at the insistence of Charles Francis Adams, who was the son of one president and the grandson of another. But there is still separation throughout the North. There is a case in New York in 1855. There is a case in Michigan on a steamboat in 1858. And they are losers. The people who bring the lawsuits lose eventually in the highest court of those states. So then we have the Civil War. And after the Civil War, we have these three civil rights amendments, the 13th, which abolishes slavery, the 14th, which establishes equal protection and grant citizenship rights, and the 15th, which uh, establishes voting rights for black men. You notice I said black men, and not all people of color. Men only, women could not vote, and they won't vote for another 60 years. So, these three, okay, Answer it. Uh, these three amendments are a revolution. And the reason that they're a revolution is because the original Constitution embraced slavery. This one has rejected it. And that means that the Supreme Court has to re-evaluate what it thinks about this system of, of, uh, of race in our country. In 1857, in the Dred Scott case, Justice Taney, Chief Justice Taney said that blacks could not be citizens whether they were free or not. And now they are being granted black citizenship. This is not an accident. This is the radical Republicans in Congress after the Civil War looking at the Dred Scott decision and saying we are going to, by amendment, change that decision. Change that decision. In 1867, in 1866, Mary Miles, in the midst of all of this ferment, all of this uh, action in Washington, she is a teacher in the suburbs of Philadelphia, and she boards the Westchester Philadelphia Railway, and she decides that she is not going to be moved from the white car. She, of course, is ejected. She's actually placed, not all, this didn't occur all the time, she's placed on a platform miles away from anywhere. She has to walk some 10 miles to get to anywhere that she can find her way home. And she decides that she's going to go to a white lawyer named Char uh, George Earle, George Earle, E-A-R-L-E, -E, who comes from good abolitionist stock. Uh, 
and he, and he is going to take her case. But she fits into a whole a movement of resistance that's going on in Philadelphia at the time. So while Andy told you about how he was chagrined, and he should be, by this history, there's also the uplifting part of what people, both white and black, were trying to accomplish in Philadelphia in 1865. In January, now this, the Civil War has not ended yet. The 13th Amendment is moving through Congress to ratification, but it has not been ratified by the states, so it is not a part of the Constitution. But that ferment is there. A group of 69 Philadelphians, all white, form a committee in which they're going to pressure the railway companies, the streetcar railway companies, to allow the people of color who are passengers to come inside off of the outside railing where they were required to ride, no matter what the weather was, inside the car. And they meet with the railway presidents. There are 19 railway companies at the time. And one historian said that, that Philadelphia was undergoing a railway insanity. 50,000 passengers a day were riding these streetcars. The population of Philadelphia was about 600,000. It was on its way from 565,000 in 1860 to 674,000 in 1870. And 4% of the population are people of color. That is the highest percentage anywhere in America. Greater than New York, greater than Boston. North. North. And I'm sorry, you're right. I shouldn't have said America. In the, I've, in the free North. Thank you for that correction. So it's not like there's still a lot of passengers out there, but when they are passengers, they are riding on the outside of these railway cars. And it's embarrassing because there are black Union soldiers who are trying to ride the railway cars, and so it, it just feels wrong. Well, they meet with the railway presidents, and they come up with a very ingenious idea. They're going to take a vote, because this is democracy, right? And so they print up cards. They advertise this in the newspaper. They're going to have a two-day vote, and they're going to distribute it to the passengers on the railway cars and ask them what they would prefer except that it's only distributed to white passengers. And surprisingly, they don't prefer to have the black passengers come inside. So the railway companies report that they're sorry the passengers don't want this, and they're going to continue to have this system. There's a story, a very good book written about Octavius Cato, C-A-T-T-O, a black activist who ends this system. That's not my story. My story is about Mary Miles, who's on the railway that is not the streetcars. So Earl takes her case, and he wins. He and his law partner win in the lower court. But they go to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court in 1867. There's an oral argument on April 1st. The legislature of Pennsylvania helps them out, it, it appears, by passing legislation calling for a form of equal rights. But the Pennsylvania uh, Supreme Court is unmoved by the action of the legislature. Now, who are the Pennsylvania Supreme Court? They are Republicans. They are from the party of the anti-slavery Republicans who were founded in, in 1854. You would think they would be sympathetic to the cause of Mary Miles. But the, the opinion is written by one Daniel Agnew. And I'm going to read to you a little bit of his decision, because his language is rather remarkable. The five judges included two Democrats and three Republicans. They could have issued a narrow ruling citing the legislature's new law as a complicating factor. But Daniel Agnew, a Republican, chose instead to write a majority opinion that amounted to a treatise on the wisdom and legality of separation. It was extraordinary in its fervor. Agnew declared a, quote, right to separate, perhaps a first for the Pennsylvania court. In Agnew's view, there was no shortage of good reasons. Preventing violence, preventing violence was one. Quote, if a Negro takes his seat besides a white man or his daughter, wife or daughter, the law cannot repress the anger or... It's okay. These things happen. <laughs> 
The law cannot repress the anger or conquer the aversion which some will feel. He could have added some whites would feel, but he didn't. It is much wiser to avert the consequences of this repulsion of race by separation than to punish afterwards the breach of peace it may have caused. A railroad rule is reasonable to preserve order and decorum, he wrote, and prevent contacts and collisions arising from natural and well-known customary repugnancies, which are likely to breed disturbances by promiscuous sitting. I don't know if that was an accident. And then he invoked the creator, the separation of church and state just. The creator had an ordained separation by making two such dissimilar races. But he said reassuringly, to assert separation is not to declare inf inferiority in either. It is simply to say that following the order of divine providence, human authority ought not to compel these widely separated races to intermix. Status quo of, the, of Pennsylvania society was separation, he wrote. Blacks live apart, visit and entertain among themselves, occupy separate places of worship and amusement, and fill no civil or political stations. Why, he suggested, should trains be any different? Well, I wonder why they weren't in those political offices. So Mary Miles loses her case. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court has decreed this after the Civil War. And Daniel Agnew's legacy is, is that his case is cited by the majority in Plessy as a precedent for separation in 1896. So just a few minutes about the, Pennsylvania, uh, the Louisiana case. New Orleans is, the case, is where the case comes from. It's a city unlike any other in the country. Any other in the country. Why? Because when the American takeover occurs in 1803, the provisional governor, that was what his title was, who came from Virginia, arrived to find 6,000 free people of color in 1803. They were French, some were Spanish, and they were mixed race. They, they had been promised their rights in the Treaty of 1803, and they asserted for the next the rest of the century, that they wanted those rights that had been promised them. He wrote to Madison, who was the Secretary of the State, and to Pre and President Jefferson, and he said, guys, uh, I got a problem here in New Orleans because I have these 6,000 free people of color, and they have a militia, and they have weapons, <laughs> and I'm not sure what I should do about this. Well, Unfortunately, his letter took a month to get to Washington and a month for Madison's reply to get back. And his reply didn't really satisfy the, the governor, whose name was Claiborne. The reply was, you're on your own, buddy. <laughs> and so Claiborne realized that he could not disband this group. He needed their support. He certainly didn't want to cause any, any violence. He wasn't sure that they regarded him as a legitimate person to be there. And so over the course of the next 80 years, the free people of color, new generations come along and they, they know about what happened in 1803, they know about what happened in 1814 when Andrew Jackson for the Battle of New Orleans recruited free people of color to bolster his army and he promised them rights. And they know about 1863 when the federal troops arrive and they occupy New Orleans and they promise more rights <laughs> and they send the free people of color send two delegates to Washington to meet with Lincoln, and he's very sympathetic, but he's got to win this war, and could you just hold on a little bit? And they are there in 1867 when there are streetcars, remember it's the same year, 1865, 66, 67 in Philadelphia, in 1867 in New Orleans, there are queues of white and black passengers in the streets waiting for the mule-drawn streetcars but the white passengers don't have to wait for the black star cars, only the colored passengers. And yet, if there are a lot of white passengers, they say, well, could you move aside, please? We need to get where we're going, so we're gonna take over the black star cars, and we're gonna ride those too. And so that creates protests. And William Nichols, on one April 1868 day, 67 day, boards 
one of the white cars and he doesn't want to be moved and he wants to go to jail and he wants to go to court and he's standing on the sh shoulders of David Ruggles. And then we come to 1890, 1890 Severed Car Act. And Homer Plessy in 1892 is a volunteer. He's recruited by the committee of mixed race, French speaking Creoles to get arrested because, as I write in the book, he's fair skinned enough to cause confusion. And the lawyers want to argue that if you can't tell someone's race, how the heck are you going to separate them? They also want to argue a lot of other things, all based around the 14th Amendment. And the court says, no, we're not going to. Uh, we're not going to use your 14th Amendment arguments. We're going to decide this case as a matter of states' rights. Louisiana has the police powers, the police powers to preserve law and order. Now, where have we heard that language before? In Daniel Agnew's decision. So you can see this line of cases. That's how it's resolved. Now, at the time when Plessy is, is, is decided, there's not a lot of stir because the court had already laid out its view of the 14th Amendment in previous cases. It takes another 30 or 40 years of more precedence, precedence building upon precedence, for the Supreme Court to recognize that Plessy is the beginning, Plessy is the landmark case. And in 1954, they reversed themselves, which they almost never do, and say that Plessy was wrongly decided and separate is inherently unequal. That's a sketch of the story. We're going to go to questions. But before we do that, I'm going to read you one more thing from the book. And that is a quote that I couldn't leave out from Dr. Martin Luther King, who said in 1957 the following. Men hate each other because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they can't communicate with each other. They can't communicate with each other because they are separated from each other. That's my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Was there a dissent in the Pennsylvania Supreme Court? There was one dissent from, from Justice Harlan. And as I said, it was a ringing dissent. I'm sorry. Oh, in, in, the, in the Pennsylvania case? Yes, there was one dissent. And the reason I don't remember it is, is that it was a dissent without any words. It was just a dissent. So we don't know what that, just, that judge was thinking in, in the case. So it was, it was four to one. Did you look at how Brown versus the Board of Education, how Plessy versus Ferguson played into that? I mean, I know it did, but do you talk in your book anything? I don't talk in the book about it, but I can tell you about it. The question was about Brown versus Board of Education. <laughs> So it's really interesting what the Supreme Court did in 1954. Their language, they, it, Plessy is just referred to a couple of times, but it, but it says that the court had announced a doctrine of separate but equal in Plessy versus Ferguson as background for what we're facing here. If you read the majority decision, not only will you find that there, the words separate but equal don't appear in the majority decision, but I defy you to interpret what they wrote as an announcement of a doctrine. I don't think it is an announcement. There's certainly the word announce is not used, the word doctrine is not used, separate but equal is not used. So why is the Supreme Court in 1954 saying this? Why are they creating this impression? And I think it's because they needed to be clear, unambiguous, and unanimous. And so they were saying, this is the effect of this law, of, the, of this ruling, not a law, this ruling, and we are not going to beat around the bush about it. But it, it, it surprised me when I became, because I had read the Brown decision, but I hadn't read Plessy. And when I read Plessy, I said, well, that's interesting. They don't have an announcement of any doctrine. They were embracing, I think one of the most important things to, to realize is, I get frustrated, I have Google alerts with the word Plessy in it. I get a lot of things, clearly there's some schools named Plessy in New Orleans. Uh, but I get frustrated with the description that goes as follows. The Supreme Court established the doctrine of, Ple of separate but equal in Plessy and made it the law of the land. Now, it did not make it the law of the land. It, it opened the door for other states to make it the law of their state. But they didn't establish a law of the land. That's not what the Supreme Court does. Congress does that. 
What frustrates me about it, though, is, is that I think it leaves the rest of us off of the hook. The Supreme Court did not create separate but equal. The Supreme Court merely endorsed it. We created separate but equal. We in the North, we in the South. It is not the shame of the Supreme Court. It's the shame of the South. It's the shame of the North. It's the shame of all of us. So that's why I don't like that phraseology. You're supposed to clap when I say that. So how do you feel or how did post-reconstruction in the South sort of play into all of this too? I don't want to let the South off the hook in any way. I mean, the shame of the South is greater than the shame of the North. It's just that everybody has a cross to bear. So post-Reconstruction. Uh, Reconstruction was an amazing time. The most important politicians in America were the ones running Congress, not the ones in the, right, in the White House. That's where the engine for those amendments comes from. And by 1877, when the federal troops are withdrawn from the South, the South has been obviously angry <laughs> for a good 10 years. Why? Well, Confederates of high-ranking positions in the Army were not allowed to vote. Confederates in the government of the Confederacy were not allowed to vote. They saw their political power eroded. They saw their economic power destroyed. And their reaction was fear and violence. There's no other way to put it. The Ku Klux Klan arises in Tennessee in, immediately after the end of the Civil War in 1867. It spreads to North Carolina. This is the cauldron in which all of this is, is bubbling. Meanwhile, voting rights for people of, uh, for black men, voting rights allows people of color to be elected to state legislatures, to the Congress, and you have four million people who are formerly enslaved, now liberated, some two million of them probably are of, of voting age and they're, and they're male. Look at that group and you say, well, they're inferior to us, that's what the people who are white in the South felt, we're not going to let them seize what is rightfully ours. This is the lost cause argument of, of the South. So there's a lot of anger. And by 1896, in the Plessy case, what you've had is the enactment of laws, not company policies like in Massachusetts and on the railroad in 1838, which are beginning to create a regimen, a, re a regime of enforcement by a government, which is different than an enforcement by a corporation. Sometimes we think they're the same, but I'm not sure how often we want to, we want to talk about that. Um, so does that answer your question? There, there's, you know, the white supremacy, when I saw what happened in Charlottesville in a couple of years ago with white supremacists marching there against Confederate statutes, which the removal of Confederate statutes, which might have been just a, a, a pretext for the reemergence of, of that movement, I think of the 1870s and the emergence of white supremacy then is a reaction. It's the same sort of fear, the same sort of violence that arises from that fear. It's always about political power, economic power, social power. Hi, I listened to you today. I'm a student at Community College, and I just want to know what motivates you to come here today? I have to write about you today, so that's why I'm here. <laughs> I didn't even know I was going to be here today, but I came today. But what motivates you to speak about what you speak today? Well, as a journalist who's often had to go to things to write about what people are saying, I applaud you for coming. <laughs> well, for 40 years, I've been a journalist. And often in my reporting and my editing, I was uh, working on stories where race was a, either a, an important component or a part component of those stories. And as I looked around for a new book topic, which is what authors do, I felt that I really didn't understand the roots of our racial conversation. And I wanted to understand it. Um, now, some people have asked me, well, like, how did you as a white guy decide to do this story? You know, I don't see it that way. I see that this is a story that all white Americans should know, all black Americans should know. It's the story, you know, Black History Month was very important when it was started. We should get rid of Black History Month. It's history all the time, all the time. So, but I was motivated in part by the complications in the story. I mean, Henry Billings Brown grows up in an abolitionist neck of the woods in Massachusetts, and he runs into people throughout his young life who are anti-slavery, not just in 
word. They didn't just say they were. They were anti-slavery indeed. They protested. They wrote letters. They helped in slave rescues of people who were enslaved in the South and had fled to the North, and people were trying to bring them back across the Ohio River to the South. So I was fascinated by the, how this guy could end up being the author of this terrible, infamous decision. And I was fascinated by John Marshall Harlan, who's a white guy from Kentucky, from a slaveholding family, who ends up writing this ringing dissent saying that separation is wrong, that this decision will one day be regarded as shameful as Dred Scott, the one that said that blacks could not be citizens in 1857. So I wanted to understand them, and I wanted to understand what motivated the people who were resisting separation in the face of violence, in the face of intimidation, in the face of people saying, what is wrong with you, this is the way it is, that they could go back continually and fight against separation. So that's the things that motivated me. I have a current day question. Do you think a hard right Supreme Court under an avowedly racist president could chip away at Brown versus the Board of Education, could allow states, who, and not all of whom are anxious to maintain a desegregated society, to start to enact legislation uh, that was at least consistent with some sort of resegregation? Well, you hit me in my most difficult spot, because as a journalist, I really don't want to start commenting on politics in that kind of way. So let me, add, but I want to give you an answer. I don't think we're going back to Plessy. I don't think that's possible. But that's the, that's the most extreme situation. You use the phrase chipping away at the rights of. And yes, I think there will be attempts to chip away at the rights of people to have opportunity and fairness and equality. But we don't need to chip away at it. We already don't have equality. If you look at the statistics of wealth, of education, the, 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 the way we uh, educate people, the way that housing is, is done, you see inequality embedded in our system right now. Uh, people of color do not have the same wealth because they've been saddled for generations that go back to the 19th century with virtual sh shackles instead of the ones that for, for real that they wore during slavery times. Um, so do, do I think that I mean, you know, housing was something in the 1930s, a book that is a very good book if you want to read. There's two books I'm going to mention. One is The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein about the creation in the uh, federal government of redlining, of policies that didn't allow loans to be made in certain neighborhoods because they didn't want people of color to be living in those neighborhoods. And another one called Not in My Neighborhood by Antero Piatilla, which is about Baltimore, which is where I live. These are two very good books about how a government policy caused segregation. So I think it's possible that, you know, there are all kinds of people in politics and they can bring all kinds of, of laws. So chipping away, sure, they can chip away. I don't know about the Supreme Court, though. I think there are certain things that the court is not going to go back on. I don't think Plessy, we're, we're not going back to Plessy. Hi there. Um, 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 I think that we can, for the most part, um, staunchly agree that um, things were separate, but certainly not equal, in that still, of course, exists today, because this whole campus agenda, and W, X, Y, and Z. I can't hear you. Put, put oh, the microphone closer. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I said, um, I think that we can agree upon that things are separate, but certainly not equal, certainly even back then. It's, it started a precedent, but things were certainly not equal, certainly when it comes to funding and W, X, Y, and Z when it came to things after that period. But um, a question that I had was that this case was based upon in Louisiana, correct? And the plaintiffs, for the most part, were uh, light-skinned uh, Louisiana, I guess you could say Creole people, is that correct? So do you feel like because they were um, light-skinned Creole people, you know, who had, you know, French and Spanish in them, the whole bit, that, that was part of the reason why this actually became a precedent and why this was so effective, because of they were representing people who are light-skinned or, or, or who were fair-skinned at the time? Well, I think it starts with, so the head of the committee who brought the case, the committee to test the constitutionality of the separate car law, a real mouthful, he was a guy named Louis Martinet. He was a newspaper editor, and he was mixed race. He wasn't as light-skinned, I don't think, as Homer Plessy, but he had attended the 1883 National Convention of, of Colored Men that Frederick Douglass had originated 
was held in Louisville, Kentucky. And, and that speech that Douglas gave at that convention is in many anthologies. You can read it today. It's actually not the speech that he delivered. It's the speech that he prepared. The speech he delivered was reported in newspapers at the time, but it wasn't the text that Douglas handed over for printing. So some of the, the meat of it is lost. But Douglas was very strongly saying to that group, we must not wait. We have waited too long. We are waiting and waiting and waiting. You must act. Louis Martinet was one of the delegates from Louisiana in the audience that day in 1883. And he thought he was doing what, he wasn't taking Douglass' uh, advice, he just thought he was part of that vanguard. I am going to act. So I don't think that the court, the court did not understand that this case was a, an arranged arrest. I don't think they really understood the nature of the political group that brought the case. What they understood was, because the lawyers for Plessy told them so, is, is that this fair-skinned man who is almost white, they called him one-eighth, one-eighth black. Now, I, I'm not at all interested in talking about percentages in, in somebody as, as a way of describing them. But I did the genealogy, he's more like one-quarter, and the lawyers just wanted him to be as white as possible because that was their argument, is that he looks white and yet you're calling him black. And so the, the, the court was just taking those arguments as they came. The, the, one, the most amazing argument that Albion Terje, who was a white lawyer, the most famous white advocate for civil rights in America in 1896, his, his most uh, unusual argument was he knew that the court was filled with, with justices who really safeguarded property rights. They were zealous about property rights. So he wanted to give them a property rights argument. So he said, now try this on for size. He said, your race is your property. It belongs to you. Your reputation belongs to you. And if you can pass for white in an America where being white is better than being black, then no conductor should be able to take that race away from you without due process. The conductor is walking down the railroad car. He's not taking testimony. He is both police officer, he's arresting you, he's, or he's asking for your arrest. He's your judge, you're, you're white or black, and then he sentences you to the other car. That's a lot of power to give to a railroad employee. That was Turgé's argument. Now, the court didn't buy it, because they didn't decide it on that ground. They decided on the, on the grounds of Louisiana has the right to you know, keep law and order. But think about that. That's not a very good argument, because the court had said, okay, we like that argument, Albion. We're going to make a car with white people and mixed race people and black people. <laughs> That's what that would have ended up. That's not a very good argument. But like a lot of lawyers, Albion Tourget wanted to win, and he thought it might be a winning argument. Forgetting the uh, 19th century. Forgetting the 19th century? I don't moment. think I can do that. I know. I know your family history. <laughs> if you would be willing to be political and predictive. OK. Number one, I have a question and then a follow-up question, which is, aren't we already still a separate and unequal society? White America has effectively created that situation, even though it theoretically eliminated redlining. Philadelphia is a good example, and we're still probably one of the most progressive cities in the country. We have a, a large African-American population, uh, but they're still not allowed equal rights. The court is chipping away at voting rights, which you didn't mention at all, and I know that you know that. Uh, aren't we heading to a virtual, separate, and unequal society Current, I know, that's what I'm saying, already, and one that will be permanent, and what is your view of that? I think you stated your view of it very well. <laughs> I think I'll leave it there. I think it's not, well, you asked me what I think of it. Well, I've, what I think of a separate and unequal society, whether we have one or not, is, is that I don't want to live in that society. That's why I write this book. Um, the, the review in the New York Times said it better in some ways than I could. What it said was that the book is written with energy, elegance, and, an, and a heart aching for the end of this kind of inequality. Um, that's true. I think that ac accurately captures what I was trying to do. Um, whether or not we will ever get there is only, it's all dependent on us. And we have to keep talking about these issues. 
I don't want to be that one of those people who says we have to talk about things because it's more than talking. But we have to do, we have to elect people who have different views. We have to put pressure on people um, who are nominees for the Supreme Court. Uh, that's the way in which a democracy works. And I'm in favor of democracy. <laughs> I'm glad you used that phrase because I think it's a good one here. So the question was about Harlan getting woke. So what was his conversion about? And I think it's important because Harlan stands in for all of us who need to be woke, right? I mean, he, he has, he's pro-slavery in 1859, as I said. Now, it, two years later, he raises a Union regiment. He's a colonel in the Union Army. He leads a, a group of Kentuckians to fight against other Kentuckians and Tennesseans. And he, is, uh, he writes an open letter in which he said he is not going to fight to end slavery. So if, be, if it becomes a war to end slavery, he's out. Now, fortunately, for him, not for me, fortunately, he doesn't have to make that choice because his dad dies and he leaves the army, which many people did, before the end of the war. But after the war, he opposes the three civil rights amendments because he says that they take powers away from Kentucky. And as Kentucky's attorney general, which is what his job was at the time, he wants to let Kentucky hold on to its prerogatives. He joins the Republican Party, the Anti-Slavery Party, in 1868. And he does so because he can't bear the Democrats. Because the Democrats, their ranks are filled with ex-Confederates, the very people who tried to destroy the Union that he believes in so strongly. Uh, he meets Benjamin Bristow, who becomes the first Solicitor General of the United States in 1870, becomes the Secretary of the Treasury, and he is Bristow's campaign manager for president in 1876. And Bristow was way more radical than Harlan. Bristow is the US attorney prosecuting the Ku Klux Klan under the Enforcement Act of 1867. And I think Bristow has a huge impact on Harlan. There are some people who try to find the seeds of Harlan's evolution in his childhood. And they actually have misidentified some documents that suggest that maybe Harlan wasn't pro-slavery or he was a, more of a fan of liberty than, than we understood or something like that. I reject the seed theory of history. I think that that's an example of where we know the outcome. Harlan writes the dissent. And so we're going to go back into his childhood to find the things that make us feel comfortable that it was there all the time. I think that that's wrong. Harlan evolved. We can all evolve. We can all change. And that's, that's how I see Harlan. You spoke of um, later decisions as uh, standing on the shoulders of Daniel Ruggles. And I thank you for introducing me to Daniel Ruggles. David, I'm sorry. Just David, to, yeah. my fault. David Ruggles, I wasn't familiar with him. But I wonder how you would assess the role of someone that I've always admired, um, which would be Ida B. Wells. How do you assess her role in this period? Well, this book was, it's 500 pages of text. It used to be a little longer. It used to be a lot longer. And in the 50,000 words that are only resident in my home office, you can read the story of Ida Wells. Now, Ida Wells is a crusading black journalist, and you might know of her because she conducted a campaign against lynching starting in the 1890s. And she even went to Europe to, to uh, prosecute her campaign. Um, there, are many, there are many good books about Ida Wells. She writes a book of her own, her own autobiography. What is a little known story or a lesser known story about Ida Wells is that like Mary Miles in 1882, she refused to leave the white car on a, ten uh, on a Tennessee railroad. She, takes, she, she actually refuses twice. She brings two lawsuits. She wins in the lower courts. She loses at the Tennessee Supreme Court. And I told her story in full, but something had to go, and that's why it's not in the book. So how do I assess her role? You know, she was inspired by Albion Terje, the lawyers for Plessy. Now, I haven't talked much about him because I don't have the time, but Terje was a um, best-selling author his novels were about Reconstruction, and he had a, he had a column in the Chicago Interocean. He called himself the bystander, which was ironic since he was anything but a bystander. 
And he wrote constantly about how the South, the, the North misunderstood the South, the South was worse than you think it is, how the North should be ashamed of standing by while all this lynching is going on in, in the South. And Wells was so inspired by, by Terje that she wrote letters to him and asked him for his mentorship, which he provided to her. Um, Wells goes on her own campaign. Terje's campaign is embedded in his, in his books and in his, in his columns, whereas hers is much more focused. And she goes on a lecture tour about lynching, which takes her to most of the major cities in the United States, uh, at least in the North, um, in the 1890s. Um, She's a very, very important uh, person in terms of how she embraces activism as a way to make her, her case. Because she doesn't just use the, the courts, she doesn't just, she, you know, she fails in the courts, so she decides that maybe that isn't such a great way to go. And she uses instead the power of the printed word, which is an author I can certainly endorse. <laughs>